I'm going to start with the story, a story of my son. I immigrated to this country with my son when my son was a toddler and my husband. And I had a dream for my son, which is very simple and profound. I wanted him to be a confident Muslim, and I also wanted him to be a Hafid. I enrolled him in a weekend Islamic school, and every time this drama goes on, every time, every Saturday, when he gets ready and goes to the weekend Islamic school, he will look at me and say, Mom, do I have to go? Mom, why do I have to go to weekend school? And then the classic, Mom, can I skip today? And this was going on for a while, for weeks and months. And one Saturday, my son Muhammad put his, put his foot down and said, he looked at me and he said, Mom, why do I even have to be a Muslim? Why can't I be like Mike or Joe in my school? When he said that, at that moment, I felt like everything stopped. Everything stopped within me and around me. The weight of his words was suffocating. I couldn't breathe. I looked at him and I said, like, what do you mean by that? And I was thinking in the back of my head, your father and I will give everything so you can succeed in this life and the hereafter. And here you are telling me why I have to be a Muslim. It made me thinking what he is engaged in the weekend Islamic school. It was not happening when I thought what was happening with his learning. He did not engage very well in the Islamic school. I realized this wasn't the right journey. And I was at that time working full time just here in the Bay Area, in Redwood City. I was enrolled in my master's in San Jose State University, and I had another baby. My plate was already full. And I also had the dream. I didn't want to leave the dream, because I wanted my son to be a half it. Realizing the situation, I put pause, and I, I just put an emergency break. The emergency break is not in a traffic light. Emergency break was in all spheres of my life. I took sabbatical from my work. I took time off. I put my master's on hold. I put everything else on hold. And then I started engaging with my son. Because I know that is my priority at that time. Everything else in life can be paused, can be done at later in time, especially in this country. You will see people who are like 50 plus years old doing their masters or doing their studies and whatnot. I'm not able to go tell my son, Muhammad, stay right where you are. Let me come back and catch up with you two years later. Can we pause life? Can we pause life? Can we pause our work? Can we pause our studies? Can we pause our like house project? Everything else in this world can be paused, except life. You cannot pause life. Every single day, our kids are growing, and my son was growing. Alhamdulillah, Allah gave me tawfiq to prioritize what's important at that moment. So I took sabbatical from everything else, and I started engaging with him via stories to make him understand the purpose of Muslim life. What is the purpose of our life? And then slowly and slowly, things started changing, and he started engaging with me. And Muhammad will come and ask me, Mom, why do we have to pray five times a day? And I would look at him and say, like, don't you think it is an opportunity for us to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with the Creator, the King of the Kings? And he's like, really? Yes, Muhammad. It's your one-on-one -on -one with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can pray, you can ask. Even if you miss your toys, you can go and ask him. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for whatever needs, whatever happy, whatever worries, you can say it. And then he started slowly engaging. And then 
he was still memorizing, he started memorizing, and then he'll come, Mom, it's really hard for me to memorize. And I would look at him and tell, yes, Muhammad, it is hard. But you know what? You get reward for saying Alif Lam Me. If you say Alif Lam Me, you get 30 deeds. He's like, really? I said, yeah, you get 30 rewards, but you got to memorize it. And then one fine day here in Fremont, I was strolling in the park with my baby in the stroller and Muhammad was next to me and it was a nice breeze day and then we were going and then Muhammad, Muhammad asked me, he looked at me and he asked, Mom, Yasmin in my class memorized Surah Yasin. she's ahead of me. And then I was like, mashallah, that's good for her. And then, but he wasn't like very happy about it because like, you know, somebody else has memorized more than him. So I used that opportunity. But you know what, Muhammad? If you memorize the entire Quran, nobody else can memorize more than you. And then that made him thinking, oh, yes, Muhammad, you can memorize the entire Quran and nobody else can memorize more than you. You will be ahead of the game. But it's not easy. It's a hard work. It's a lifetime commitment. Are you ready for this challenge? Was my question to him. He couldn't say no because I didn't force it. I encouraged him. I challenged him. And next thing you know, 5.30 a.m. in the morning, I wrap up my baby and Muhammad driving to the Hifz school where he would memorize just two lines. Amma Yatasan, just two lines while I wait in the car, either nursing my baby or feeding my baby. And that became our routine. Five years later, Alhamdulillah, Muhammad graduated as a Hafid. And we went to India to celebrate his Hibs graduation. Alhamdulillah, Muhammad is an adult now. He's actually getting ready to go to Arafah. He's in, uh, he's in Makkah, Mina, he's in Mina right now. Just make dua, may Allah accept his Hajj, and may Allah make everything easy. Today, I run Muslim Nation Builders with the same principles of intrinsically motivating the children so they practice the deen with passion and conviction. So I help parents to raise such children where the children would love to practice the deen. Because today, I see many parents struggling when it comes to instilling the deen. I myself was there once upon a time. And I see many parents struggle with the issue. And Alhamdulillah, it's been almost a year with Muslim Nation Builders, we are making the change because we are making the impact. Because one of the narrative that I wanted to change is the narrative of my son, which many kids I have heard. And I wanted you to raise your hand if you heard this. Can I not go to weekend school? Or can I skip the school? Or can I not go? Or can I like come up with all the excuses for not going. Can you raise your hands if this is familiar so I know. So this is the familiar case. And I really wanted to change that narrative. Last year at this time, I was working so hard to launch Muslim Nation Builders because I wanted to change this narrative. Alhamdulillah, Allah blessed with a stellar team. And we, I, ha I had an opportunity last week and I was in Fresno. We have an on-site maktab for Muslim Nation Builders. I asked the children, because I wanted to ask them this question, like, if your parents are bringing you to Muslim and the maktab, and then if your mom is taking you to like, get together or park, which one would you choose? And most of them said, they will come to M and B. Because the way how we teach the children is through engagement. Because we don't want the children to feel that way. And I want to go over to the topic, today's topic, which is the last shepherd. So Prophet ﷺ mentioned, every one of you is a shepherd and is responsible for his flock. What does it mean for a Muslim parent to be a shepherd? And if you see a shepherd's life, a shepherd will take care of his herd, Fully care, fully care about them. And we as parents, we are responsible for our children within us. And this, this is what the hadith mentions. And I actually went very deep to find, to study the life of shepherd, to see what it means when Prophet say that we are the shepherd for our children. Where are we lacking and we are still struggling? I went deep into it to see like, 
there must be some gap on how we are parenting and how Prophet said. I went to study actually life of a shepherd to see and compare that with ours. And I'm going to just share a few of the things, steps here. Now, I want to go back to, because I was myself a lost shepherd when my son asked that question. I had the dream of making my son a half with, and my son was digging the ground, asking the question, why I need to be a Muslim? Just imagine the contrast. When I'm trying to reach the stars, he's, trying, he's digging the ground. I don't even want to be a Muslim. What are you talking about? I just want to be like Mike, Joe. They are not praying. They are not going to weekend classes. They get all the time. So you see the difference? I was myself lost. Even though, as Muslims, we prioritize what we wanted, but then I think the message that our children are getting is totally different. And that's why I was a lost shepherd. What was I missing? So if you see my life back then, Alhamdulillah, I'm a practicing Muslim. I was living with my parents, Muslim friends. We go to, we pray five times a day, we fast in Ramadan, we read the Quran, we take the kids to the masjid. So from when you look from outside, everything seemed perfect. Like, wow, mashallah, look at Fauzia. They are raising the kids. She's doing this, she's doing that. Everything, everything was perfect. But something else was smoking inside. I didn't, I didn't notice it. I was missing something, and I'm going to share that what are the things that I missed. And I didn't know this back then, but alhamdulillah, I'm going to share that with you. Now, the very first thing is the shepherd knows. The shepherd knows where he's going. The shepherd will know like, okay, I'm going to take here, I'm going to go here, I'm going to, he doesn't have to share, tell the herd, but he knows, he has an idea. As parents, we know our journey. As parents, I myself know. I know like, okay, this life is not forever. One day will be my last day. I will breathe last and then I'm going to die. Inshallah, Allah will raise and inshallah, Allah will accept my good deeds. Inshallah, Allah will bless me with the Jannah. We know this journey. I myself knew it. But then, knowing and understanding is different than internalizing what it means. Even though I knew, everyone else was like that, but the actions, my actions, they're not reflecting the real purpose of a Muslim. And that was the message my son got. The hereafter, the purpose of a Muslim wasn't focused he was getting a different message. Because if you take an immigrant life, right, when they come to this country, what do they do? They try to stabilize themselves. My husband was a doctor, and at that time, he was studying for his residency, so he was away. There's like typical things like, you want to have a job, you want to have a car, you want to have a home, you want to take a vacation, and then the, repeats, the, the thing repeats next. You want to have maybe second car, you want to have the second home, you want to go even nicer vacation, and whatnot. That's a typical one. You know, this is fine for any people, any immigrant, but this is not fine for Muslims because we have a different purpose. We have a different purpose and that's not reflected in my life. Even though I knew all these things, the message my son was getting was totally different because I was focused. Just imagine a mother, a young mother with a baby joining the masters and working full time and doing all the things. So he must have thought like, mom is like really crazy she's trying to climb the corporate ladder that's the message he got and I want to share another story here so two years ago um, we went to Cappadocia uh, in Turkey with my sister's family and uh, it was a Turkey trip it was a three-week trip but the highlight of the trip was Cappadocia so everybody knows Cappadocia has you know, these nice hot air balloons. We prepared, my sister is there, we prepared for the trip months ahead. Me and my sister literally will do a Zoom call every other day to talk about which hotels, where are we going. So once we finalize, we involve the kids. We tell them like, okay guys, we're gonna go these four days, we're gonna go to Cappadocia, and this is our itinerary, and uh, it's gonna be very beautiful, pick your nice dresses or make sure you take your sunglasses. And every other week, we'll watch some 
travel documentary about Cappadocia or Turkey. So the kids are excited. Oh, mom, I want to eat there. Oh, mom, I want to go here. Oh, mom, I want to do this. OK, do everything, add everything. And then when the day came, the guys already told us, OK, listen, the sunrise is at like 5.30. This location is like half hour drive from the hotel. But you have to leave like 4 AM. So to get here and to get on the balloon and to see the sunrise. So we prepared the kids ahead of time, like tomorrow we're going to go. Tomorrow, I mean, not just like, we like, we basically told them, this is going to be, this is going to be the highlight and you can't just be in the room watching. The, the hotel that we stayed, this is the hotel. It's a cave hotel and they had nice uh, TV and whatnot. And the kids want to hang out, like, can we watch Netflix? Can we do this? I said like, listen, you can watch Netflix even in California. You don't have to come to Turkey to watch Netflix. So they know that next day morning they need to get up and then Alhamdulillah, they all got up. We even made a plan B because what if something happens, we miss. So we made the plan B and but Alhamdulillah, everything went smooth. I want to pause here and ask a question. Is Cappadocia beautiful than Jannah? It's not. But then why are my kids so excited and everything went as per the plan? New adventure, okay, what else? Attraction, there's also one more main thing. Preparation. We prepared the kids months in advance. They know that they have to wake up. They know what are the things needed. And they were excited by it. They were really excited because we talked about it. We watched documentaries. It was a real thing. I never talked about Janna to my son like this. I have to be honest. Janna was not even in the conversation. Hereafter is not even in the conversation. I know, okay, we have to go. My son knows the Kalima and, you know, we have five pillars of Islam, but he hasn't internalized the purpose of being a Muslim. So he was not excited. If he is not excited, if he is not in internalized what it means to be a Muslim and where our journey is going, you think he's going to put that extra effort to pray, to read Quran, to do X, Y, Z, to fast and whatnot? Not just my son, any, any kid. Do you see the gap now? I did not prepare my son, make him internalize what it means to be a Muslim. Yes, he was going to Islamic school. Just like everybody was sending, he was going to the Islamic school. We have to understand something very clearly here. The kids who are drifting away from the deen, it's not because they don't know the information. They will know one by one. You ask five pillars of Islam, you ask six pillars of Iman, they will know everything. It's not about they don't know the information. It's about they haven't connected to it. And my son hasn't connected. My son did not connect. And I haven't prepared him for this journey of life. And that is one of the reasons he drifted away. As I started engaging with him more and more about Jannah. So it's not like a fantasy. Like, you know, fantasy is like, it's not real. Yeah, yeah, mom, I know you. We're going to get a lot of good deeds. Like, kids think that way. Like, I know, no, you, if you pray sunnah, you get this. Like, but then it's sunnah. It's like a lot of good deeds. They still, they, they, they don't see it as a tangible thing. That means they are, they are not connected with it. I have something, um, and if you want to note down, you can note down, inshallah. This is something um, I prepared, 25 ways to uh, earn your Jannah. So if you want to uh, note down this, you can note down. This is a PDF, it's a plain PDF. Like, you know, simple things that you can do with your children. Simple thing, like for example, whoever meets Allah without ascribing anything to him will enter Jannah. And then whoever repeats after the Mu'addin, from his heart, sincerely will enter Jannah. Like the kids come to masjid once or twice a week, all they have to do is just sit quietly and then repeat it. 
and that gives them jhana. There are like 25 ways I, I put together, so you can take a look at it. So the first step, I think you are clear now to see what was missing. The children were not excited, the, even though the shepherd knows, the children doesn't know like the real journey of life. I'm going to go to the second one, which is prioritizing the now. The shepherd prioritizes now. If you go to a shepherd and ask him, what is five-year plan? He will have no clue. He will laugh at us. What are you talking about? Because his priority is the now. Has the herd been well fed? No enemies? No sickness? His priority is now. And I want to share a story again. So when Mohammed was like around this age, six or seven years old, I moved closer to the work in Belmont. I moved closer so I can be, uh, because I had a, a nursing baby, so I can come home from work and nurse her, and I can see the, the office building from the window of my bedroom. So it was very convenient for me. And there was a small uh, uh, Islamic center. I don't know, anybody familiar with Belmont Yasin Center? Yeah. So there was, there was very small, uh, very like only few parking, but very, very small, and then, but they were very active. I really liked it because I can go there, like take him, and, uh, and then they had like the thriving community slowly building up. And I was just thinking to like, oh, maybe I can settle here, settle down here. Like maybe I can buy a home here. And people were looking at me like, Fauzia, you can't buy a uh, home here. This place doesn't have a good high school. High school for a six-year-old is not matter. But that's how the society thinks. At that time, what I needed, I was prioritizing the now. But people around me and the community, they were like saying, they're not good high schools here. High school is like seven years down the road. If we don't prioritize the now, there's no future. There's no future. But then the community is wired to think about it far ahead. Far ahead, plan for them, plan for this, plan for that. Because I see parents who work double jobs or who leave the kids and go work to earn their living because that's the only way they get like, there's like, okay, so my kids will have better future. But you know what? You being with the kids and giving the tarbiya is the better future than that extra 20K that brings or than the extra 30K that brings. I didn't realize this back then and then I have to, I have to basically let it go because I wasn't prioritizing the now. But the shepherd, if you see a shepherd, he doesn't have a 401k plan. He doesn't have a one year plan. If you ask the shepherd two years down the road, where do you think you're going to take? He's like, I don't know. I don't care. He doesn't care about the risk because he knows the risk comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When he takes his herd, he knows. See, this doesn't mean that we don't have to focus on the education and whatnot. I'm a software engineer. I still work full time. I finished my job this, uh, this evening. My husband is a doctor. It's not that we are not focusing on the education. We have to focus on the education. Our kids need to be educated. But the priority we need to give, especially when the children are young, is the deen. Is the deen. The priority is the now. Yes, if my son would have gone to a better high school, he would have gotten an Ivy League school, he would have gotten a whatever job, whatever that is. That is the, that is the paint that the society paints for us. That is the aim, the goal, the, the fancy thing. Everybody goes like, okay, that, because that's what the entire world goes beyond. You guys are living in the Bay Area, you know the pressure. When your child turns 12, 13, you know the pressure, the school pressure. And when you are in that pressure, anything related to thee is pushed towards the bottom. And that that's exactly, that exactly happened to me. And then that's exactly is happening to many parents today. But the priority is now. If you prioritize now, then inshallah, risk will come. The risk that's written for your children, no matter what will come. Of course, we need to work for it. Of course, they need to study. Of course, they need to do well. Of course, they need to do in education. I'm, I'm not like saying anything in there. But the priority always, your deen needs to be in the top. The deen has to be here. 
your SAT comes here, your football comes here, your extracurricular comes here. But if you see now, everything is other way around. Don't wake my son for the fajr, he has exams. Which is important. I think as parents, we are losing that priority. And that's the message our children are getting, and that's the message my son got. That's the second step, and I want to go into the third one. Shepherd knows to lead lovingly. So, I want to actually share a story. Share a story. So, I had an opportunity to interview an ex-Muslim. A Muslim who was raised by a very practicing family, but who left Islam. I wanted to interview him to understand what made him the decision to step away from Islam. It was supposed to be a 30-minute interview. But the interview lasted for two hours. Two hours. And I learned so much from him. And one of the things that he mentioned, he was raised by his parents in Middle East, and he moved with his parents to North America. Everything was a shock for him. The weather is a shock. The culture is a shock. The food is a shock, the schooling system, the gender mix, everything is a shock. But he was trying to, you know, cope up with everything and then he had doubts about the deen. You know, racing in Middle East, obviously, all the, we assume that the foundation is, mashallah, tabarakallah, is coming from everything is good. But he had so many doubts and he went and asked his mom and dad one time that he has some doubts about the deen. And then his parents, astaghfirullah, how dare you ask this to us? Did we raise you like this? If you even have this thought, you're going to be pushed to hellfire. How dare you ask this? And I asked him, okay, first time your parents responded like that, did you try asking him again, asking them again? He said like, Sister Fauzia, I tried again and again and again. What is that? When I talked to him, yes, he was 29 years old. Yeah. He said he moved here when the 9-11 happened. So when he was around 11 years old. And he told me that they started, they never, they never showed empathy. They never encouraged my question or even helped me. So because, because of that, he went elsewhere to find his answers. And he said he was not alone. They were like a pool of boys who was exactly in the same position like he was. But he was bold enough to declare himself that he is not a Muslim when he was above 18. But his friends, he said, they were scared. And he said one more thing. They are in the crossroads, his friends group, when they are about to get married. If they say they are outside, nobody will give him, give the boy's girl. But if, they, if, he, don't, if he doesn't say it, they have this guilt of starting his, their married life with a lie. But he was bold enough to declare. I just want everyone to make dua for him. May Allah bless him back. May Allah give him tawfiq so he comes back to Islam. Meeting someone in Zoom call is different than meeting in someone in person. I got an opportunity to, in a conference, I saw him in person. That really hurt me. That really hurt me. Because he told me that every time he talks to his mother, his mother would always bring the topic of like, can you pray? Can you do Jumma? Or it's Ramadan. And he said, like, Sister Fauzi, I don't, I didn't want, I didn't want to break the heart of my mother. So I reduced the phone conversation with her. So I tried calling her once a month instead of once a week. And in another, in another day, you know, Allah put me in a position. He was talking with another woman that, that I know, and I was just walking there. I, didn't, I was not part of the conversation. And then that woman turned to me and she's saying, oh, Fauzia, you have to hear his uh, uh, convert, conversion story. I, was, I, I had a little hope, like maybe he became Muslim. And then she told me, oh, he, just, he was just sharing um, how he became a Christian. I was like, OK. I mean, it was, it was so painful. He didn't expect that her to tell me. 
because he, he was just having a one-on-one -on -one conversation and then I, I just went there. Allah put me in that place so I can hear that and she told me that and he kind of avoided to have the conversation and I didn't want to go in further to ask him brother why but I did ask this question to him forget about your parents forget about the community forget about your experience I wanted you to start from scratch why don't you do the research yourself start from you he said yeah I'm right now going through Buddhism Hinduism I have no I'm gonna I'm still in my research and then he just left it off the reason why I'm telling the story is Two things, how Islam is taught to the children, how the empathy was missing. And then I want to actually go back, go back to Sira of how Prophet ﷺ treated new Muslims. So if you see the first 13 years of the Sira, Prophet ﷺ focused on these four, the Tawheed, the love of Allah, the belief of unseen, the building Iman. These are the four things Prophet ﷺ focused. No rules, no regulations, because Islam was new. He was, make, he was basically building the Iman and the love of Allah to all the Sahaba. And he was so kind. He was so kind to the Sahaba. They were all new Muslims. As Muslim parents, we have to have the same compassion our children are new Muslims. We have to get that in our head. Just because Abdullah and Amina are born in my family and your family, it doesn't mean that they are automatically Muslim. We have to treat them and we have to make sure, we have to internalize this characteristics of being a Muslim in them. And when Prophet ﷺ was focusing, I wanted you to compare that, our approach today. If you see here, our approach, this is today's approach. This is only a small pie. Tawheed and Jannah mindset. The rest is rules and regulations. The do's and don'ts. Don't do this. Don't do this. This is halal. This is haram. Rather, a seven-year-old or eight-year-old have to understand and internalize what it means to be a Muslim. And that's what we do in MNB, Muslim Nation Builders. We have to, we are relearning what it means to be a Muslim. Because kids have learned in some way, like they come and say, oh, my mom t tells this, my mom tells that. I did a research, actually. I did a case study. What I did, I interviewed Muslim youth directors across the country. I have only two questions in them. Ask them. I asked them, as parents, we are doing our effort raising our kids as Muslims. We are doing, we are practicing, and we are putting effort and money and to raise to, we are sending them to you, to the masjid or uh, wherever they go. And you are also, mashallah, doing a good job. But I still see the gap. Why are still children drifting away from Islam? This, these were only my one question, actually. This is the one question. Why are our children drifting away from Islam? And where is the gap? And I was mind blown with what they shared with me. I was mind blown with what they shared with me. And I'll share just this one thing. He said, Sister Fauzia, the children come on the weekend for a few hours. We teach them. We teach them. And then the children goes back home, Monday through Friday. They go back to public school, and then they go home. They see things totally opposite to what we teach, both from the parents and from the environment. So the children think the teacher is crazy. And the next week and come, the children come back again, the children learn, and the children think the parents are crazy. So they told me, we are losing the children from the get-go. From the get-go, we are losing the children. There's clearly a gap between what the children are being taught and what the parents are doing. That's one of the reasons, like I, when I launched Muslim Nation Builders, right, I involved parents from the get-go because I am used to the regular Sunday school model where I drop the kids, I go finish the grocery or I go sleep or I watch something, a movie, something, and then I pick up the kid, khalas, done. I have no idea what's been taught. I have no idea what's, what the children learn. I have no idea. I want to change that. And in Muslim Nation Builders, we involve the parents. 
Without the parents' involvement, you can't even move a stone. The parents get information about what their children learn. The parents get to know. The parents get to do the activity with the children so they have the engagement. So going back to the subject, if you see, so this is a clearly what the approach of today and what's the Prophet Sallallahu approach. And, and that, that is why I created this, we created this Muslim Nation Builders Maktab system where, where this is a journey of Muslim to Muhsin. Uh, to Muhsin. So the, this gap that needs to be addressed, the, the gap, it has to be a three way. Parents need to be involved, children need to be involved, teachers need to be involved. And three of them need to work as a team. And the three of them, the parents, parents need help too. I'm not saying so. That's why, you know, parents are on the board. Otherwise, it's much harder. And this is the journey that we actually teach. We teach, if you see in this, the first, the very first one is being a Muslim. The foundation, the foundation of what Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi teach, like the Tawheed, the children are relearning what they've learned. So we are forming the connection like the Tawheed, the love of Allah, the building the Iman and the belief in the Ansib. The next one is actually practicing what has been taught in the first. Because if this layer is missed, if this foundation is missed, no matter what you say, no matter what you teach, it will not latch. It will not latch. And that is why many parents are struggling. That is why I personally struggled as well. This foundation is the key. But parents come back and say, so I, I, let, me, let me tell you. So before launching Muslim Nation Builders, I launched my signature course uh, called Parenting GPS. I coached parents from like around the globe, around like four countries. They were all inspired, they loved it, everything. But then they struggled when it came to bring their children. So when, when, when I coach the parents, they're at this level. But then the children are here, they had hard time bringing the children up. Because the children, because not every parent knows how to engage with the kids. So we need a place where the children get the same transformation just like parents. So only then the gap is filled. And alhamdulillah, that's when I launched the Muslim Asian Builders because all of them are at the same level. The parents, the teachers, and the children. All of them are at the same level. Now, how do we do it? Nurturing the Jannah mindset. Right now, your children are actually learning the Jannah mindset. And... <laughs> I'm sure many software engineers are. How many software engineers? Okay. I'm sure you're all aware of the scrum call, right? Scrum call every day morning. They ask, what did you work today or yesterday? What are the blockers? And one of the things that uh, we implement in Muslim Nation Builders is the four questions. Your children, probably you can ask these four questions. Why are we here? Where are we going? What to expect? And what's the purpose? These four questions, I train parents to ask these four questions again and again, like a broken record. It doesn't matter, it's a broken record. When your child comes for a morning tea or coffee, just ask these questions. Muhammad, assalamu alaikum. Why are we here? What is our purpose? Where are we going? What to expect? There's a reason why we ask these questions again and again. In the middle of night, if you wake up your child and ask these questions, yeah, man, don't wake me. We are here. We are on a journey to our hereafter. Our purpose, this is the purpose of our life. What to expect? Shaitan is there to take us away from this purpose. Because this, this will be internalized. But we have to ask again and again and again. So it's carved in their heart. They know. Imagine if a child has this carved in their heart and goes out, you're packing the bags and everything, he's going to, he or she is going to step into the college, you don't have to worry about it because you already did the work. You don't have to worry, oh my God, what is he going to do? Oh my God, what is she going to do? Is she, you can't babysit. We cannot babysit our children like forever. They will own the religion and we wanted to raise the children who owned their religion, 
who runs for the practice, who runs for it. Like today, the reality is, I understand, it's totally different. The children, when asked to pray, Dohar, there's 15 minutes for Asar. I said, like, when we said, like, I asked you to pray Dohar. Yeah, I know. There's still 15 minutes more for Asar. That's the mentality our children have. I still can pray towards the end. But then we want our children to make wudu and be ready before there's 15 minutes for the other and for Dohar. But how, would, how do we bring that change? Unless we have that Janna mindset in our children, we cannot do that. Our children need to have this thing carved in their heart. They have to have this card. And we do this in m &B, day in and day out, like, again, it's a child-centered approach. One of the things that I want to um, highlight here is, I already mentioned that it is not the lack of information that our children are like deviating. We have to speak their language. We have to speak their language so the children can engage. The children need to be heard. The children should have an opportunity to be heard. And this is exactly what we do in MNB because this is exactly the method that we have to engage the children. We have to engage in a way they want to come back again and again and again. And if we don't do that, all these things like I explained how my son was hesitating will happen. Can I skip? Can I not do that? Oh, I already prayed. Or they'll fake the practice. That's because the connection is not there. And we have to go back and make them relearn what they learned and fix that connection. So inshallah, after that, everything else will fall in place. Again, the children, the lessons are conducted in a way that naturally involves kids in the learning process. And it's all open-ended discussions. Open-ended discussions to have the children actually tell them. And I always tell, I always have this, the onion peeling layer. Like if you ask the kid, like, why, like, you just go to a store and tell them, like, nobody's seeing. Can I just take this and then walk away? Just wait for your child to answer. No, mama, it's wrong. Ask the child back, why is it wrong? Well, you're stealing something. Yeah, nobody saw it. Why is it still wrong? Well, Allah watches it. Okay, what happens if Allah watches it? Well, it goes as a bad deed. Okay, what happens if I get a bad deed? Well, it's not good for you. I know it's not good for me, but what happens? So you have to keep engaging with your child with these questions, so you get a window of what your child has been thinking. So then you know, okay, then let me like do this, let me do that. So that engagement is, you can provide it at home, you can also have in your, in your wherever they are learning, they have to have this engagement. Again, all these is like, you know, when I formed Muslim Nation Builders, I. One of the things that I, I insist my teachers, I train the teachers, I insist my teachers is the prompts that they have to send a summary to the children, uh, to the parents. So for example, if your child goes to the class and uh, I get an email saying, Abdullah has studied Sira, they studied our brother, and then there'll be prompts for parents to ask the children, like, and then I'm driving and then asking Abdullah, Abdullah, I just saw a message from a teacher. You guys learned about Badr. Can you tell me more? And then Abdullah will come back and say, yes, mom. It was so cool. There were only 300 plus Sahaba, but they won. Really? How did they win? And then Abdullah goes on and on, whatever he learns. And with excitement, he shares. And then on a weekend get together, you see your Abdullah, among the other kids standing up and narrating the seerah. Isn't that a coolness of the eyes? Because that's the connection that we want. Because today we see children coming to Umrah, going there, like, you know, they go there, but then they're not connected, they're not excited, because sometimes as adults, we are like, we cry, like, uh, this is the place of Uhud, this is where Rasulullah was hurt, because we, we have that connection. But if you ask the kids, like, I'll take a picture of selfie from the car. It's so hot outside. I don't want to come. What does it show? 
they are not connected they are not connected and that is why it's very important you layer the first foundation first and then everything else will fall in place they will run they will do it and this is these are some of the activities that we do i want to um, point out to this so this one if you you see this this is a sticky pad and uh, we actually do it as a sirat al mustaqim sirat al mustaqim is filled with the the path the sirat is filled with all the distractions and we ask the children to list down the distractions that they face in their life they can say video games they can say this they can say that and then we make the children walk to see like you know how they walk what they do and then these are the things that actually if you see they will they will actually write down what are their list of distractions and all this is written by the children like all this is like written by the children like what are the things like this is the real engagement where the children are engaging and this is again the sirat al mustaqim where you one way is like you go straight or one way is like you come back or take a u turn if you are not on the straight path and again parent connection is very important where we engage with the parents with what they've learned and then some of the things we we practice in the maktab we take the qualities we practice it both in the school and at the home so we tell parents to practice it for example gratefulness or patience so if you take gratefulness parents will like you know you'll get prompts like you know even simple things right like be happy that we have a roof over our top there are children who don't have home be happy be thankful to allah to have clean water there are there are places in the world where they don't have water so it's been practiced again and again in the school and home that will make the child even so when they next time when they pull the tissue roll in the bathroom they'll be grateful for that because kids today they are not grateful at all they are very they they just wanted everything to be like okay entitlement like you know i need this because we have to change that because we've been feeding them with golden spoons but we have to teach that gratefulness for them to actually see the value of what they have been blessed with so this is the maktab system that we have the teachers are trained by muslim nation build this team and then when the kids join the parents and child assessment is done the children are taught both online and on site and then parents i coach parents monthly once so they go over so there's a support there that the parents will actually um be coached by me or any any issues that they have they will basically go one by one with me and this these are some of the some of the testimonials from our students um this is from uk and this is again from uk another one um and abdullah from california i like mnb because it's unique and not boring like the other weekend schools the work is different than usual i find it uh, helpful to open myself to reality and to islam and know more about what i should do and what i should not and to learn how to repent to allah if i do something wrong and th these are again some of the testimonials and we have three age groups builders 7 to 9 years old and then architects 10 to 12 years old and then we have engineers 13 to 16 year old and all your children have been like based on their age we they are been currently been taught by their respective teachers and we have the sala champion course that's coming up um it's a two week course it's going to be both online and on site if parents are interested you can just note down this uh, qr code cuz this is just focusing on the sala two weeks um for the summer primarily um, we call it sala champions it's just focusing on the sala and starting inshallah july 8th i'm almost done if you're interested to bring mnb to your city this is the form and i'm open for any q and a <coughs> if you have any question is that okay so if you raise your hand i'll come over to the mic with the mic to you those that are watching online you can type in the chat box and we'll monitor we'll get your questions to sister Rosia
The instructors are taught under which madhab? Is there a specific madhab or is it like madhab agnostic? Uh, and are they credentialed by some Islamic institution? Yes, yes we have Sheikh Adana here who, who is overseeing our curriculum. We don't follow one particular madhab. Again, our instructions is, it's even go, going below the basic first. Because we are not teaching fiqh. We are not teaching fiqh or like that's like much later. What we are doing is we are building the foundation. The foundation, that connection, the love of Allah, the, um, yeah, I'm forgetting, <laughs> I'm fasting. So the, the four main core pillars, that's where we are building it from the journey of Muslim to Mu'min to Mu'min. Any other question? Any feedback, any question? Inshallah, we are planning to start the Salah Champions in, in MCA uh, or in Santa Clara, San Jose. Um, but the MCC uh, here, I mean, we have to have teachers and teachers trainings, but Alhamdulillah, we have teachers in San Jose, uh, Santa Clara area, but we also have it online uh, where kids can come on for like for 10 days, every day, 90 minutes. Um, they will learn about the, the Salah, Inshallah. And we have again, three age groups. Uh, 7 to 10, 11 to 12, and uh, 13 to 16, inshallah. Any other question anyone has? Um, we don't have an office, but we have a maktab. Right now we have a maktab in Fresno. We are on the works to start something in the Bay Area. Um, Alhamdulillah, we have teachers and we also have, we haven't decided the location. Uh, we want to do one in Fremont, but if the community is interested, if there are many parents interested, inshallah, we can put something together for your city. It is, it is agile. It is not like related to any like one particular location or anything. I have two questions. Yeah. How can one become a teacher? Mm -hmm. And is this like a program for like a year, two years, five weeks? Like what's the format? So our maktab is a 10 month program. We start the first week of September. Uh, for this year, we're starting the following year. We're starting on September 9th and ending in May. It's a 10 month program. The students meet monthly once, uh, sorry, weekly once on Saturdays or Sundays, depending on the need of the community. Right now in Fresno, we, they meet on Saturdays between 10 to 2, four hours they have instructions. Uh, online, we have from 8 to 10.30, like two and a half hours. And Alhamdulillah, we have students from four continents and again, three age groups. This Salah workshop, this is something, a piece of whatever we taught before. And uh, because Salah is something most of the parents struggle in, even Islamic schools, they struggle. So we created a bundle where we train the teachers to deliver this um, uh, Salah Champion program to the kids. So the kids can like, you know, connect with it, understand the why behind it, and then, you know, do it. Does, does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Yeah. So our current model, again, it depends on area to area. In the Bay Area, uh, in the Fresno, we charge $2.99 for a child uh, for a weekend. For online, we charge $1.99. So per child. Per child for, per month, no, per, per month, month, per month. And our teachers go through, see, there's one of the reasons why we got all these testimonials from the students, especially, is because of the effort that we put in training the teachers. Every week, the teachers are being trained. So they will go through the lesson plan, what is going to be uh, uh, taught that Saturday. They will go through the lesson plan. That's one meeting. And there's another meeting where the teachers will share what went well, 
what are the examples see the content is the same how the teachers take it and teach it depends on the personality of each teachers so then they will share their experiences so that's like a learning for all the teachers to learn oh that's an interesting idea i didn't think about that and then they learn so that actually enriches the experience of the parents for the students and the teachers so it's a weekly once meeting saturday or sunday on site for 4 hours for the bay area we don't have a location yet we are working on something because the fremont masjid um the mec uh, was interested to do a collaboration with us so we can conduct our classes there in mec um alhamdulillah we've got teachers in the bay area they are being currently being trained um so that is a possibility but again it depends if the parents in the other area are willing to they want it the children to attend it one year or like it's usually it's a 10 month program so the kids kids actually learn fully and then our students who were learning with us for the last day they're going to inshallah continue the next second year from september so it's a 10 month program for summer we are doing break for summer we are doing this small uh, courses like especially focusing on certain areas of what has been already taught We have a question online. Um, somebody watching internationally. Is this course offered for children and parents living in Europe? Yes, we have students from Europe. We have students from Ireland. We have students from London. So if you see these, um, uh, all these testimonials, we have these students from UK. We have uh, one in Ireland. We have one in Europe. We also have one in. Africa actually we have a student from Africa and i was surprised we also have students from Saudi Arabia i did ask the parent like why are you here <laughs> they said like well our children alhamdulillah they're all doing but they are doing like robots so there's no connection that's why i want to bring them to muslim mission builders so they can learn and i was surprised i didn't expect a student from Saudi Arabia but alhamdulillah we we got students from Saudi Arabia as well any further questions yeah how different will this program be if you are attending islamic school or if you are attending weekend uh, masjid school so like i mentioned okay this is the first difference the parents are involved from day zero from day zero the parents are involved because the parents and children they go to, through some assessment to understand what the level is like what where they are and everything and then parents go through monthly coaching how they are doing what are the difficulties the parents we are keeping the parents in the loop so the children can succeed without the parents you cannot move a stone you cannot move a stone parents in moment if the parent is too busy you know what i can just drop and pick up i don't think i have anything to do more than i don't think this program is for them this is the parents and women parents need to involve like i mentioned the priority is the now and i understand i work full time too and i know as parents we have so many things that's going on that 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 needs attention but then everything else can slow down if we prioritize the kids and then the second thing is if you see here how it is different um like i mentioned the engagement and the activities that is done in the classroom makes it different and we are like i said we are focusing on this first layer which is the foundation the children will relearn what they have already learned they will relearn they will internalize the purpose of being a muslim from a different angle once they have that and then everything else will fall in place they will they will they will understand like okay now i know why my mom is saying this now i know why my dad says this so we are working on the foundation that that because if you see here this is the foundation for 13 years out of 23 years Prophet Salah's lifetime more than half of the time was spent just on this foundation and you all know even the prohibition of alcohol was not during the first 13 years 
And we all know the hadith. If that happened only in Medina. That's because he built that foundation. He nourished them. He nurtured them. Today, we are not following that blueprint. We are not following this model. And what MNB is doing is, we are teaching them exactly by following that blueprint. Because once this is solid, everything else will be solid. Because if the foundation is not weak, and this is what happened, the children will be very good until they turn 10, 11 years. They will do everything you say. They will even, when they go to bathroom, they'll come and ask you, mom, can I use the bathroom? They are that dependent. Once they hit the 13, 14, things will start changing. Things will start changing. And these are not my words. These are the words of the, the youth directors that I interviewed. Because the environment they are growing up are very agnostic, very atheistic. And they have been pumped with so many things, so many doubts. If this foundation is not strong, and then we start building so many things, one day or other, it will stop crumbling. And the kids will start, there are so many children who fake the practice of Islam. And so many children who are Muslim at home, who are just like an American outside home. But we don't want that. We wanted our, par our children to be Muslim in and out, young and old, until their last breath. That's what we wanted. And that's what we try to do in MNB. Do we have additional questions? Please raise your hand if you like. I promise you this, before I close, let me say this. If you let us hold your child's hand, and also yours as a team, you'll begin to experience a meaningful and joyful moments in practicing the deen. Because it has to be worked as a team. Like I mentioned before, parents are struggling to bring their transformation, because not all the parents know how to do it. And I will later share, um, because I have most of your email addresses, I will share an article with you that was written one by one of, the, uh, one of our instructors. He, he's actually currently teaching the 13 and 16 years old. He works in MNB and he also works in uh, Sunday school. And he's given the difference on how things are taught. See, it is not that lack of the information. It is the training that we lack. And it is not just one school or two schools. Our, the way how we approach Islam, the way how we teach Islam needs to be changed. To make a change, it needs to be changed. OK, I think we are close to Maghrib time. Jazakallah khair, May Allah bless you for the initiative and bringing this to the community. We look forward to seeing you more in the Bay Area here. We're pushing against Maghrib, six minutes, inshallah. A reminder to all those uh, that are watching, inshallah, the deck for symposium is on the video description, so you can watch that, you can refer to that again. And then those that haven't had dinner, there's a dinner process for sale on the foyer. We'll have a Maghrib prayer in five minutes, inshallah. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.